Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood to introduce our guest. Well, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Mara, and I'd like to thank Dr. Mara for coming and doing this. Dr. Mara is a professor here in the Department of Neurology and Medicine and is uh, one of the world's uh, neuro ID specialists, and thank you. So Brian asked me to talk about meningitis and HIV. So I thought I'd start first just very briefly talking about susceptibility to central nervous system opportunistic infections in HIV, and I know you know a lot of this already. But one of the things that's most helpful to me in narrowing the differential when I'm faced with an HIV-infected patient with a CNS opportunistic infection, or I think may have a CNS opportunistic infection, is to think about the CD4, because that helps me narrow the differential in terms of susceptibility. So people... Uh, who don't have a lot of immunosuppression can get neurosyphilis or uh, CNS-TB, becomes more common as the CD4 drops. For neurosyphilis, we know that a cutoff of 350 for CD4 becomes a time when patients are at increased risk. For things like HIV dementia, cryptococcal meningitis, and toxoplasmosis, patients are generally significantly more immunocompromised. Generally, the CD4 is below 200. And for cryptococcal meningitis, which we're going to talk about in more detail, the risk really uh, goes up at 100. For things like primary CNS lymphoma and progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, risk really starts when patients are very immunocompromised, typically a CD4 below 100, although there are always exceptions to the rule. You certainly would be suspicious of a diagnosis of, of any of these things, toxo, crypto, PML, lymphoma, in a patient with a CD4 of, say, 500. And then CMV encephalitis I put on this table, although it's extraordinarily uncommon now, but typically occurs in patients with CD4s below 75 or even lower. So CD4 can give you a feel for what your patient's at risk of, and I find that helpful in narrowing things down. The other thing to think about in terms of susceptibility are exposures and prophylactic therapies. And some of the most obvious ones in terms of exposure are serum antitoxoplasma antibody. Patients with HIV who get CNS toxo or toxoencephalitis generally have reactivation of previously acquired disease. 97% of the time that's true. And so they have positive serum antitoxo antibodies. Those can be lost in really late HIV, but it's uncommon. So it's really a good screen for whether a person's at risk for toxo and that's the reason we check for toxo seropositivity when people first enter care. And then something people may not think about a lot, but we think about neurosyphilis a lot here because there's a big outbreak of syphilis in Seattle King County. You can't have neurosyphilis if you've never had syphilis. And the serum treponemal tests, the FTA ABS, the TPPA, and the various enzyme immunoassays measure treponemal antibodies, and they'll tell you if your patient's ever had syphilis, because once positive, always positive. So a person who doesn't have reactivity in those tests really shouldn't be considered as at risk for neurosyphilis. And then prophylactic therapies, the um, obvious ones, Bactrim prophylaxis against toxo. People who are taking Bactrim regularly are at much lower risk of toxo than people who aren't taking it. And fluconazole will prophylax fairly effectively against cryptococcal meningitis. This is a little flow diagram uh, approach to diagnosis in a patient with meningeal symptoms and signs in the setting of HIV. So most common etiologies, cryptococcal meningitis, TB meningitis, syphilitic meningitis, at least uh, in our region. The things you would think about are the things we've already talked about. So CD4, is there CD4 below 200 or below 100, where I'm really going to be thinking about something like crypto? Are they taking fluconazole, which would make crypto less likely? Are they receiving TB therapy, which might make TB less likely or um, might make TB meningitis more likely? TB meningitis can crop up during the course of treatment of pulmonary TB. Serum cryptococcal antigen can help you determine if a patient's at risk for cryptococcal meningitis, PPD or IGRA, chest X-ray, and then FTA, ABS, the TPPA, or the EIA as the risk factors for uh, neurosyphilis. And then in neurology, or neuro ID, and neuro HIV in particular, we think about CNS iris, just as you would think about it for uh, other diseases in people with HIV defined as clinical worsening or new disease after starting potent antiretroviral therapy. 
It can be paradoxical, meaning that you know the person has a CNS infection, you start their antiretrovirals and they get worse, or it can be unmasking. So you start the antiretrovirals and the person presents with a neurologic illness. For the big time players in uh, HIV neurology, CNS iris is a problem for two. So it's not a problem with Toxo and particularly not a problem paradoxically with Toxo. So there's really no reason not to start your patient with CNS Toxo on antiretrovirals as soon as you can. There's actually a good reason to do it because those people are less likely to become demented. Dementia is a big problem in patients who have had toxoplasmosis. It rarely occurs in an unmasking setting, so starting antiretrovirals, coming up with toxo, but it's really uncommon. For progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, it's a big deal. About a quarter of patients will develop iris either in the paradoxical or unmasking setting. And because antiretrovirals are the only known effective treatment for PML, it's a big problem. And then we're going to focus on cryptococcal meningitis. Notice that paradoxically people can develop um, iris up to half of the time. Um, so you know a person has cryptococcal meningitis, you're going to start them on therapy. And a big question is, when should you start their antiretrovirals? It's less of a problem in terms of starting antiretrovirals and having a person develop cryptomeningitis. So CNS iris, difficult to distinguish from relapse or new infection. Patients uh, deserve a thorough diagnostic evaluation. You need to either start or intensify specific therapy most of the time. And the role of immunomodulators, such as steroids, is totally unknown in PML and cryptococcal meningitis, which are the two settings in which we're most commonly faced with the question. So I'll tell you about a case I took care of a few years ago, 29-year-old man with a very low CD4 on therapy, but probably not taking it, who presented with headache, fever, nausea, and vomiting, and had a normal neurologic examination. His CT showed microvascular disease, which we'll come back to, so sort of rarefication of the white matter that can be seen with small vessel disease in people with hypertension or diabetes. CSF opening pressure was elevated at 290 millimeters of water, or 29 uh, centimeters of water. Remember that above 200 is abnormal. Had a mild CSF pleocytosis, 69 white cells. They were all lymphocytes. Very low glucose, high protein at 158. And his CSF cryptococcal antigen titer was reactive at 1 to 2048. So he had cryptococcal meningitis, not a surprise. Um, in HIV, most cases are caused by the Grubii variant, infections acquired from the environment, not from person to person, and meningitis is usually due to reactivation of previously acquired infection. This is an example of Cryptococcus on India, Inc., just to show you that the main virulence factor of the yeast is this um, capsule that excludes the ink. You can tell these are yeast because they're budding, that's probably a white cell. Sometimes it can be hard to tell the two apart, which is why you look for buds. Um, the CSF organism burden can be so high in cryptococcal meningitis and HIV that you can see the organism on gram stain, which is what you're seeing here. These guys are yeast. These are white cells. Risk factors, we've already talked about CD4 and fluconazole. Not being on antiretroviral therapy is a risk factor, as is detectable serum cryptococcal antigen. Not everybody who has a reactive serum cryptococcal antigen has meningitis, but it tells you who's at risk and those people need to be tapped. Poor prognostic factors include depressed level of consciousness, low CSF white cells. Most of the old literature used a cutoff of 20. I'll show you a study that used a cutoff of 5. Uh, cryptococcal antigen above 1 to 1024, which is where our patient is and importantly, elevated CSF opening pressure. So the CSF opening pressure is a measure of intracranial pressure. Opening pressure above 200 is abnormal. Um, it's been shown in at least one study that an opening pressure above 350 is associated with a lower survival. The things you see in cryptococcal meningitis and HIV are fever, headache, nausea and vomiting, cognitive dysfunction. Meningeal signs and photophobia are less common than in HIV uninfected people. Focal findings and seizures are uncommon. The onset is usually chronic and insidious, but it can be acute. In terms of diagnosis, it's based on CSF. And in, at least in the developed world, 
neuroimaging should always be performed before lumbar puncture. These people have low CD4s. They're at risk for other CNS infection. You would hate to tap a person who turned out to have concomitant toxo or lymphoma and who could herniate after their tap. You should always measure CSF opening pressure. Diagnosis is established by the positive culture or a newly reactive antigen test. And remember that cell count, glucose, and protein can all be normal. This is an example of cryptococcoma in a fixed brain. So this is a coronal section of brain. Um, this is the, these are the ventricles. These are the basal ganglia. And what I'm trying to show you here are these things that can be called cryptococcomas. They're also called gelatinous pseudocysts. What they really are are just perivascular spaces filled with cryptococci. And these look like microvascular disease on neuroimaging, which is why our patient was said to have microvascular disease on his CT. You can get sort of more obvious cryptococcomas, uh, uh, globs of organisms and inflammatory cells, and that's what's shown here on this CT scan. These usually go away with therapy, don't require surgical intervention. So cryptococcus meningitis treatment is, consists of induction, consolidation, and maintenance. So induction with amphotericin, most people recommend adding flucytosine. The dose is a little lower than we use in HIV-negative people, 100 milligrams per kilo per day in four divided doses. If you have the availability, you should check uh, levels to be sure they're in the target range. There was a recent study that suggested that adjunctive flucytosine and fluconazole were equally effective. We don't do that here, but I bring that up because the study I'm going to show you used that. And importantly, aggressive ICP management is really important. It's the one thing that you actually can change. Um, so opening pressure, a measure of intracranial pressure. So how do you do it? People have an opening pressure above 250 millimeters of water, 25 millimeters of centim uh, 25 centimeters of water, should undergo daily lumbar punctures. And the goal is to decrease the closing pressure, and a closing pressure is just the pressure after you've taken out the CSF. The idea is to decrease the closing pressure by 50% or less than 200, whichever is higher. Um, you may have to do that more than once a day, depending on how sick your patient is. Lumbar drain, if the pressures are really high, or they need frequent LPs. Um, occasionally, you may have to go to a VP shunt uh, if the above means don't work, and there's no role for steroids or acetazolamide, the medical therapy we might give for elevated intracranial pressure. After induction therapy, you perform an LP at two weeks uh, to ensure that the opening pressure is normal, to ensure the culture is negative, and if both those things are true, you move to consolidation therapy with fluconazole 400 milligrams a day. That goes on for eight weeks until you uh, embark on maintenance therapy, 200 milligrams a day. And the recommendation is that you do this for a year um, until they're immune reconstituted. And that means, uh, in, at least in this particular recommendation, a CD4 above 100, an undetectable plasma um, for at least three months. In the study I'm going to show you, they defined it as CD4 above 200 and plasma HIV RNA. RNA undetectable for six months. So I was just going to bring up this trial that was um, highlighted at CROI several times, um, looking at the optimal timing of antiretroviral therapy in cryptococcal meningitis, and I think it's probably the best data we have. So this was the COAT trial conducted in Africa. It enrolled ARV-naive individuals with cryptococcal meningitis who were at least 14 years old. They entered the study at day 7 to 10 of their cryptococcal meningitis therapy, and they were randomized to early antiretroviral therapy or late deferred. Early was less than 48 hours after entry. Remember that entry is at day 7 to 11. The median was eight, eight days in this group. Um, deferred was at least four weeks after entry. The median was 35 days. The primary endpoint was survival at 26 weeks. The study planned to enroll 250 people in each group and was closed by the DSMB when they had 88 and 89 because of a significant survival benefit in the deferred group. The treatment was pretty remarkable. Um, IV amphotericin for two weeks combined with high-dose fluconazole, which might have been even continued for a third week if the CSF wasn't sterile at the two-week tap. After that, they went to high-dose or lower-dose fluconazole, 
for eight weeks, then fluconazole maintenance. They had LPs at diagnosis, seven and 14 days, and PRN, high opening pressure. So pretty uh, high level treatment for this group of patients. These are their data. So the first, and I had to pluck these off of the CROI website, which is why they're a little bit blurry and I apologize. But so this is the overall survival curve. So proportion surviving on the y-axis by months on the x-axis. You can see it, that the deferred group had a 70% survival, which is probably better than any study in Africa to date, compared to 55% in the early ART group. And then they had two pre-specified groups that they looked at in whom they found an interaction. So this is the group um, with low Glasgow Coma Scale, big difference between deferred and early p-value just on the level of significance. Didn't see this in the group with a normal mental status. So only in the group with the lower mental status did they see the difference between deferred and early. And then people who didn't have a CSF inflammatory response. Remember I showed you a cutoff of 20. They used a cutoff of 5. In these people, there was a big difference between deferred and early antiretroviral therapy with a p-value of 0.01. I think this is my last slide. So this is their recommendations to treat the meningitis first and to treat it optimally to verify that the CSF is sterile before going to consolidation fluconazole or beginning your antiretroviral therapy. They suggested that for most patients, you could start antiretrovirals at about four weeks, but for a specific group of people, those with low CSF white cells, abnormal mental status, or sepsis, that you might wait out to five to six weeks.